Hey everybody! This is the part of a presentation where my college speech professor says that I'm supposed to tell a witty anecdote so that we can all bond, but he was a total jackass, so we're just going to jump right in. This is what trade used to look like. We didn't trade goods, we traded ammo. And if you saw something you thought you needed, you went out and you took the damn thing. You confiscated it, you colonized it, you expanded into empire. And those empires fought over resources and access and markets. Those fights brought us wars, which culminated into World War II. Now, at the end of that conflict, the Americans drew their allies together and said, we're gonna try something new this time. Instead of everyone having a separate sequestered imperial network, everything's going to be pooled. The US Navy, the only one of size to survive the war, will patrol the global oceans for everyone so that anyone can go anywhere at any time, purchase any raw commodity, ship it home, metabolize it into a finished good, and then re-export it for hard currency. There's just one catch. You got to be on our side. The Americans bribed up an alliance to fight the Cold War, and that gave us this map. The deep blue are the countries the Americans cared about before the conflict, the front, the backyard. The medium blue, those are the new allies in this new global order, the first global order, the first era of international trade. Orange are the other guys. We don't like to talk about them in this country. And light blue is the field of competition. Everything mattered every day. The Americans could never deny battle. But then one idle Tuesday, in the very definition of pent-up demand, the Germans had a party, and it was all over. And it had never occurred to the Americans that they might actually win. We were convinced that the only way that this could go down is with the end of the world. Well, we didn't think about the next day. And as a result, our view of the world almost overnight changed and there's a lot of gray up there. A lot of places Americans just don't have a firm opinion. Now, the person who was in charge at the moment that the wall fell was George Herbert Walker Bush, who from a foreign policy point of view is arguably the best president that this country's ever had. He certainly had the expertise. Ran the CIA, vice president, served in the House of Representatives, ambassador to China, ran the Office of Budget. He was the right person in the right time with the right mindset and the right skill set. So of course we voted him out of office and we started down the parade of morons. <laughs> Bill Clinton, smart dude, arguably the most intelligent president we've had since Jefferson, but he had a, how should we say this, an, an ADD issue. Uh, he also wasn't interested in foreign affairs. He saw himself as a domestic renewal leader. And so when he realized that he had a summit the following day, he would call up the CIA He'd call up the State Department desk officers, and they'd come over to the White House, and he'd kind of cram for the summit like he was back in college and preparing for a test. He was a millennial before his time, if you will. And he would hit it out of the park every time. He was just that good in small group settings. Relations would soar for a day, because there was never any follow-up. And we had W, you know, let's call it what it was. A monochromatic foreign policy that dealt with one issue in one region and to hell with everything else. Obama comes in and Obama, Obama had a very strange personality quirk for a world leader. He hates people. No American president went to Congress fewer times, met with his own cabinet secretaries fewer times, met with his own inner circle fewer times, met with his own party allies fewer times than Barack Obama. Well, that's not quite true. There's one exception. You guys remember William Harrison? He caught pneumonia during his inaugural speech and then died on day 30. Obama beats him, but nobody else. So for the 24 years of these three administrations, we only had about one year of foreign policy. You guys remember the thousand points of light, the new world order? That was George Herbert Walker Bush's attempt to get Americans to have a conversation with themselves about what sort of world they wanted to live in. And we punished him for it. And just as making a bad decision can have consequences for decades, so can refusing to make a decision at all. The glory and the horror of Donald Trump is that at his core, he's got a really good point. 
The strategic order the Americans created to fight the Cold War no longer serves American strategic needs. It hasn't since the wall fell. But it was never supposed to serve American economic needs. America subsidizes the global system. The global system fights the Soviets. That was the deal. We never invested our economy in it. And as a percent of GDP, the United States remains the least involved economy in the world. We are not a trading partner. Power, we never have been. So the Americans can walk away from the global system and be fine. And that's exactly what we're doing. Raises the question, if the Americans are going to drop the mantle of leadership, is there anyone out there who can step up and replace, displace the Americans? Well, you need two things. First, you have to be able to provide global security on the ocean. About 85% of all international trade travels the ocean blue. It's got to be protected. Let's look at that. Now, on the right here, we have what's called a jump carrier. And on the left, we have what's called a supercarrier. On the deep blue sea, without any support from land-based assets, it takes eight of those to fight off one of these. Now, there are 21 of these in the world. 11 of them are American flagged. There are 11 of these in the world. They are all American flagged. The combined navies of the rest of the planet have about 4% the long-range fire cap cap capacity of the American Navy today. And at current rates of global naval build-out, the combined navies of the rest of the world will roughly equal the United States in the year 2240. As an American, I don't lose a lot of sleep over this. By the way, the Chinese have two of these. One used to be a casino. The other one is a clone of the one that used to be a casino. Context. Second, consumption, because people have to buy the stuff, right? This is what we call a standard demographic pyramid. You've got children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. This is what we call a consumption-led demographic. Because whenever you've got a big bulge in your population structure below roughly age 40, it's all about the spending. Raising kids, going to college, buying cars, buying houses, smoking pot, spend, 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 spend. Wow, we're in California, I figured that would work. Well, when American political and economic leaders look at a demographic like Mexico, we like what we see. Two big reasons. Number one, all those young people consuming, upwardly mobile, they absorb a lot of goods. Second, young people, writ large, don't have the expertise to be too high value added. So the Mexican workforce tends to be very good at low to mid-end manufacturing and assembly. That's not what the US is competitive in. We do design, we do high end. So the propensity for trade, the opportunities are huge. Mexico became America's largest trading partner last year. It's a position they will not give up in our lives. You may have noticed that the Trump administration's rhetoric on Mexico has evolved quite a bit in the last three years. It started with how the Mexicans are cheating us on trade, but that didn't resonate, not with the business community, not with Trump's core supporters. So it eventually evolved into the current issue with immigration and identity. This is a partner, and this is not. Canada had a baby bust 45 years ago that they have yet to recover from. That means they've got a huge chunk of population in their 50s and early 60s, people who have been in their jobs for 20, 30, 40 years. Very high value added, very highly skilled but they're overpopulated in that segment, which has pushed down the relative cost of Canadian high-skilled labor. And because there aren't a lot of young Canadians, there aren't enough people there to consume what is produced. It has to be exported. 80% 80, 80 of it comes to the United States. Canada has gone from being a partner integrated into the American system to a direct competitor. And that shift is now reflected in American economic policy. Now, if you can't get your birth rate back up, eventually you age into something like Japan. How do you run a first world economy without a workforce? You automate. They're the world leader in robotics because they have to be. 
Now, a funny thing about robots, they don't vote yet, so it doesn't matter where you put them. So Japan has become the world leader, not in outsourcing or in resourcing, but instead in something called de-sourcing. They've picked up huge chunks of their industrial plant, dropped it into other countries with better demographic structures so they can get closer to end markets and get on the safer side of currency risk and political risk and supply chain risk. Build where you sell. Toyota's four largest facilities in the world aren't anywhere near Japan. They're in Kentucky and Texas. Now here's, here's the United States. We're kind of in the middle. We're kind of a chimney. There's two big groups we need to talk about. First, we've got the baby boomers. They are the largest generation as a percentage of the American population in this country's history. And they are all right on the verge of retirement. That changes our capital structure. Think about how you've invested in your life. When you're 35, you put a small sliver of a small income away. Not a lot of capital there. But when you're 55, you put a big fat wedge of a much larger income. And when you're 64 and three quarters, you shove every possible dime you can into those retirement accounts. As you age, you provide more capital on easier terms to more borrowers. And as a country, we are on the very urge of the boomers' mass retirement. Capital has never been this cheap. It's been, never been this easy to get. This is the tech boom right here. But in three years, the majority of the American boomer class will have moved into retirement. The velocity of capital won't stop. It'll reverse. The cost of capital will at least quadruple which means the capital conditions that we've been used to for the last decade, almost over. If whatever you're doing takes a lot of cheap capital, get it done quick. Next generation, the millennials. Now, I normally like to spend about 45 minutes of every presentation talking about why the millennials are wastes of skin, but we're, we don't have that kind of time today. Uh, so instead, we're gonna go through all the reasons that we should all be grateful that the millennials are here. Uh, for you Xers and boomers out there, don't worry, this won't take long, there's really only three reasons. So, one, consumption. All those juice bar memberships, all those bedazzled flip-flops, and all those constriction jeans, and all those goddamn scooters, they add up. Millennial consumption has kept the United States out of recession since 2009. We would have had two recessions since then without them. That's fantastic. And they're young enough, and there's enough of them, we probably have another four years of this consumption pulse. That's great. Second, if you fast forward to the year 2030, when the millennials are in charge, they will fill out the tax paying class in a way that Gen X, my generation, never could. So there is a light at the end of the fiscal tunnel. It is not a train, it's a millennial. Whether that makes you want to jump for joy or cry in the corner, entirely up to you. Third, we think of the millennials in this country as the end all and the be all, but in reality, they're all alone in the night. Almost everybody else in the world has some version of the Japan or Canada problem. And if you look at the combined demography of the rich world without the Americans in it, it's a retirement community. The degree of capital collapse that is just around the corner is monumental. And as important as that is, what this means is the global order was going to end anyway, regardless of what the Americans did. Because consumption-led growth on this planet is about to become impossible. Quick walk around the world. People's Republic of China. 30 years after the one-child policy, they've run out of 25-year-olds because that is how math works. South Korea, aging even faster. What about developing Asia? Here's Thailand, only marginally better. You know, if there's one country that can't have an open, honest conversation about population policy, that would be Germany. And if there was one country that we were convinced, that we just knew in our bones had cracked the code on how to have a lot of kids, that would be Italy, but apparently we were all wrong. Russia, 
Even if you believe Russian statistics, this is a terminal demography. They just made up 8 million children aged 10 and under in the last 18 months. Go fig. Oh, there we go. Brazil, country of the future. They're going to save us all, right? Yeah, look at the top left of that. This is Brazil 30 years ago. Here's Brazil today. They are aging at six times the American rate. They are becoming old long before they will become rich. And the average American will be younger than the average Brazilian by the year 2042. The average American became younger than the average American, I'm sorry, the average American became younger than the average Chinese two years ago. Folks, there's only two countries on this planet that have a sustainable demography outside of the United States. And while the French can handle the catering and the Kiwis can man the bar, a global order that does not make. This was all going to end anyway. And if you remove the Americans from the equation, if you let the chips fall where they may, you get a series of brush fire wars as various countries, whether out of desperation or opportunity, feel compelled to take matters into their own hands. These are the zones that are likely to see the greatest exchanges of ammo. For those of you who know your history, you'll recognize that these are the parts of the world that historically have suffered the greatest conflicts. It's because it's where the world's geopolitical tectonic plates clash together. For those of you who know your economic history, you'll recognize these zones as the places that have seen the greatest economic growth over the last 70 years. That's because of the order, because the Americans forced everyone to be on the same side and outlawed war. It was base effect. And now it all goes into screaming reverse. The guy who is kind of midwifing this process is Robert Lighthizer. He's the U.S. trade representative. His job is to negotiate all the trade deals the U.S. has. Now, this is not his first stint in government. He used to work for the Reagan team back during the Cold War. Quick war story. If you go back to the early 1980s, the Cold War was running hot and heavy. We had a nuclear scare over Berlin in 1983. And the Reagan team saw that some of the Allies were doing things like currency manipulation that we really didn't appreciate, but we really needed the Allies lined up shoulder to shoulder, so Team Reagan turned a blind eye. But fast forward to 1985, and the Cold War was cooling off. So Team Reagan drew the Allies together at the Plaza Hotel in New York and says, look, we see what you've been doing. You're going to stop. You're going to stop today, because if you don't, the Americans will withdraw from the global order, and you can deal with the energy markets and the Soviet Union by yourself, because we got a side deal. Now, Lighthizer was assigned to the Japanese to make sure they didn't renege on the deal, because the intimidation worked. Currency manipulation didn't stop. It reversed. The US dollar dropped by half. And while Lighthizer was in Tokyo, he'd get his marching orders from the White House. He'd walk into the Ministry of Finance and lay out the American position. And then when it was the Japanese's turn to issue the rebuttal, he'd actually take off his translator microphone, disassemble it on the desk in front of them, and have a little G.I. Joe war with the pieces while they spoke. You know, when they'd finished, he'd scoop it back together, put it on his ear, say, well, that was riveting. I hope somebody really wrote that down, but we're going to do it my way, right? He makes sure he holds all the cards and that he's got backing from his boss, and then he forces the issue. This is the guy in charge. Quick walk around the world so you know where we stand. The first trade deal that was modified were the Koreans. President Moon of South Korea was smart enough to realize that there is no version of a world without the United States in it in which his country continues to exist. His country is trade dependent, and from a security point of view, if it's not North Korea, it's China or Japan. It's a tough neighborhood. So at his first opportunity, Moon walked into the White House and says, you don't like our bilateral trade deal. Okay. How do we change it so that you do? The technical talks were over in six weeks. Is it enough to keep the Americans involved the day that American troops are needed? Moon doesn't know. Trump doesn't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. But without the modification to the chorus deal, the answer would have been absolutely not. Next up were the Mexicans. Now, on the left there, you've got Enrique Pena. He's the outgoing leader. He is, from an American point of view, the best partner we could have ever had in Mexico City. 
fluent English speaker, pro-trade, pro-business, wanted deals on migration, cooperation against the cartels, breathlessly corrupt. He was just the perfect partner. <laughs> he would call up Obama and Obama wouldn't pick up the phone. He would call Trump and only get insults. Hideous series of wasted opportunities. The new guy, that's Lopez Obrador, AMLO. He's, wow, he's fun. He combined the political corruption of Hillary Clinton and the anti-foreigner sentiment of Donald Trump and the shrillness of Elizabeth Warren and the blind ideology of Ted Cruz and the pathological refusal to do basic mathematics of Bernie Sanders, just all in one guy. <laughs> Megalomaniac. And he looks at Trump and he's like, it's like looking in a mirror. Therein is light and opportunity. Say what you will about AMLO. He was smart enough to realize that if he got in a pissing contest with Donald Trump, it would consume his presidency. And he sees himself as the Mexican equivalent of Bill Clinton, a leader of national renewal. He didn't want that. So after his election, but before his inauguration, he called the White House and he called Pena, conferenced them together and says, look, if you two guys can figure out the next iteration of NAFTA, Get it signed before I take over. I give you my word, I will personally spearhead ratification. It worked. He's proved to be an honest broker. The Mexicans ratified the deal over the summer, the Americans and the Canadians, in December. It's done. Trump actually signed it today. All right, we're somewhere warm, so there have got to be Canadians here. Where are you? Come on, show me my Canadians. All right, a bunch of you. Yeah, security in California sucks. <laughs> uh, this is Christina Freeland. She's the Canadian Deputy Prime Minister. She's the second most powerful person in the country. She used to be Foreign Minister. She got kicked upstairs with the last elections. Now, in my opinion, Minister Freeland is one of the 10 smartest people in Western civilization today. Four years ago, I beat her in a debate but we're not here to compare records. Freeland's biggest advantage, I think, is she knows how to keep her ego in check, which for a politician is kind of a big deal. Now, she became foreign minister the week that Donald Trump became president, and because she's the foreign minister of Canada, her first big meeting with a foreign leader was with Trump, and she realized not five minutes into that first encounter that she was absolutely the wrong person for the job. Everyone has their own personality quirks. Trump's biggest one is that he feels he must be the smartest person in any given room. And as long as Minister Freeland was in the same time zone, that was never going to happen. So she knew that she had to step back from managing day-to-day -day foreign affairs with the United States. She couldn't be the face of the relationship. She needed someone else to put in front Someone with a nice smile and a great head of hair and a tight outfit and a tighter body. Somebody who would just stand there and nod and smile, but somebody who was completely unburdened by having anything going on between their ears. And she found the perfect person. <laughs> Justin Trudeau is by far Donald Trump's favorite world leader because he's not allowed to speak. He just stands there and nods and smiles, and Donald Trump's internal monologue fills in all the gaps, and it's very complimentary. Uh, the Canadians call it the hug offensive. You know, how Canadian is that? It was working great until a little over a year ago when the Canadians had the honor of hosting the G7 summit. And as host, Justin Trudeau had to speak, and for the first time in the Trump administration, the inner monologue did not match the sound waves. Relations literally collapsed in an hour. Now, when the Americans would go down to Mexico City for the trade talks for NAFTA II, we'd talk about rules of origin, we would talk about the digital economy and agricultural subsidies, wow. Real issues. But when Team Lighthizer would come up to Canada, they'd look at the agenda, like, today we're talking about the worker rights of left-handed, handicapped transvestites. What the fuck? The Canadians were stalling. Now, why would the Canadians think that stalling with this administration at this time in this political climate was even remotely a good idea? 
Well, to be blunt, it's because they had a really good read on how American-Canadian relations had been for the last 70 years. And it all has to do with this map. Canada is on the flight path for Soviet nuclear weapons on the way to the United States, which meant there was never any version of Canadian, excuse me, there's never any version of American security during the Cold War in which Canada was not protected for free. So the Canadians just had leverage, like no one else in the world. Now, to their credit, they did not use this to free ride on security issues. They did the opposite. Whenever there was an international crisis, the Canadian Prime Minister was always the first world leader to pick up the phone, call the American president and say, we see what is happening, we are here, we are with you, how can we help? But Canadians are not stupid. They used that leverage, they just didn't use it in security. Because at the end of that phone call, once the details had worked out, the PM would slip in, oh yeah, and we'd love a little bit of extra market access for Quebecois Aerospace and Ontarian Automotive. In 70 different occasions, the Canadians carved exemptions out of American trade law. All of them were folded into NAFTA 1. But the Americans don't see the world this way anymore. None of those exemptions were folded into NAFTA 2. So when the Americans and the Mexicans reached their deal, they did something kind of fun. They didn't announce it right away. They waited until Freeland was on stage with them. That's the moment she found out. And shortly thereafter, Lighthouser said to her, look, we have a deal with the country of the future, it's not you. We have a deal with our future partner, and that's not you. You know our terms, you've known them since day one, they haven't changed. Take them or leave them, you've got seven days. Only took six. Shinzo Abe did everything right. He was the first world leader to congratulate, congratulate Trump on the phone after his win. He was the second world leader to visit Trump in the White House. He brought a gift of golden golf clubs. He lost to Trump hideously in 18 holes. Here's a, here's a shot from the game. <laughs> Egos were stroked, asses were kissed. They hit it off beautifully. And they hit a series of deals on intelligence sharing and military cooperation that were actually deeper than what the US and Japan had during the Cold War. That's a pretty high bar. So Abe goes home, like, okay, this guy's kind of, well, let's say rough around the edges, but I can manage it. The relationship, the alliance, we're doing all right. About two months later, the Trump administration slaps Japan with steel and aluminum tariffs and starts threatening automotive tariffs. So Abe comes running back, he's like, what the hell, dude? I thought we had a deal. I thought you and your carriers were gonna be in front and the Japanese and all the other Asian allies were gonna be behind you, we we're gonna face down the Chinese together, it was gonna to be glorious and you were gonna pay for everything. And Trump's like, oh, guns for butter, like the order, yeah, I've read about that. <laughs> I'm kidding, I don't read. <laughs> no, we don't do that anymore. In fact, don't think for a moment you can call up the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Thais and the Australians and build this pan-Asian alliance that'll pressure us into multilateral trade talks. It's like, we barely did that for Canada. So Abe, little crestfallen, goes home, breaks out his copy of The Art of the Deal and rereads it, comes to the conclusion that this is all a negotiating tactic. So he plays hard to get, doesn't even pick up the phone when the State Department calls. About a month after that, the Trump administration announced finalized trade deals with the Koreans and the Mexicans and the Canadians. And four of Japan's largest trading partners have already reorganized themselves into a post-order network that doesn't involve Japan. The last big trading partner that the Japanese have is China. So Abe caves. Talks start bilaterally a month later. And just like with the Canadians and just like with the Koreans, the Japanese have to give in on everything. One of them is far more excited about this deal than the other. <laughs> we all complain about our jobs way too much. Um, let me start with the punchline here. Uh, the way decision making in the European Union works is that for any really big decision, like say divorce, each individual country has full veto rights. So Malta, freaking Malta, can veto anything. 
There was never any version of a divorce settlement that was going to involve Britain having access to the common market for any appreciable amount of time because individual countries would veto it. This was always going to be a hard crash out. The Brits were always going to be on the outside. They were always going to have a depression. And they were always going to be looking at the United States as the only country that they might be able to link up with in order to stand. Now, the Brits have been here before. Back during World War I, Americans were kind of late to the party. And we forgot to build a navy first, you know, oops. And when we finally did declare for the Allies in 1917, we rushed these bad boys into surface. This is the town class. They are bar none the shittiest naval vessels the United States has ever operated. Most of them didn't even see combat because they would stall on the high Atlantic on their way to the combat. At the end of the war, we brought them home, we put them up on blocks, we put tarps over them, we t pretended that they had never existed. World War II rolls around, we're late to that party too. And at one point, Winston Churchill comes to the White House to plead his case in person to FDR. And he says, look, if you're not going to get involved in this fight, if we have to fight the Nazis by ourselves, at least give us some gear. FDR says, we have the town class. Winston Churchill, heir to the British Empire, the greatest naval force in American or in human history, has a little stroke, stumbles to the door while mumbling thank you. FDR stops him and says, oh, no, 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 Winston, these aren't free. As payment, we will take every single military facility you have in the Western Hemisphere. That is the scale of the capitulation awaiting the United Kingdom in trade talks. Among the things the United States will demand, the complete transfer of the entire financial district from London to the United States. On the surface, it looks like they're getting along great. I mean, it's all smiles and bad hair but look who's in the back of the room. This is just getting started, folks. And then I'm almost out of time, so we're just gonna finish with China. I can give you 30, maybe 40 reasons why China will not be a unified country and an industrialized country a decade from now. This is the big one. It's the islands off the coast, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore. The Chinese call it the first island chain. And there is no period in human history where the Chinese have been able to integrate in an economic matter with the world beyond the chain. There's one exception today under the global order because the Americans have put everyone on the same side. That is the dominant reason that we even think about China as an economic power today because for the first time it's united, it's at peace with itself, and it can access global resources and global markets. Remove that, and it all falls apart with depressing speed. That's the big long-term reason. The short-term reason is Lighthizer's in charge of the trade talks, and he's been looking forward to this moment since the 1990s. Now, Lighthizer is the guy who wrote the World Trade Organization Charter. He is the most pro-free trade person in the American political system right now. And he thinks if he has to burn his baby in order to get some tactical advantages over China, it's worth the price. But keep in mind, even with a change of administration, this doesn't shift all that much. Of the 187,000 Democrats trying to get on the ticket, not one thinks that Trump is being too soft on China in trade talks. For the Chinese, this is as good as it gets. All right, we're totally out of time. So if you need a coaster or maybe some door stops, a couple ideas. Accidental is how the world got to be in the shape that it is today. Absent talks about the major conflicts of the world, what will happen when the US steps back. Disunited Nations is the new boy, comes out in March, discusses what the countries of the future really will be. You guys are the first people on the planet to get copies of Disunited. We have them out at the front of the pavilion, and we have them at the uh, reception center. Uh, take them, use them, read them, throw them, whatever you want. You laughed at everything but the pot joke, so I'm going to call that a win. Thank you very much.